Good morning, Chapel family. It's good to hear your voices, those who are here with us this morning, uh, worshiping in this uh, historic chapel here at Fort Belvoir, Virginia. Uh, and for those who are watching, perhaps even uh, live or in uh, a few short hours uh, when, it's, uh, when this service is uploaded onto our YouTube channel. Uh, by the way, you can subscribe to that channel if you look on YouTube, simply search Belvoir Chapel. Uh, and it should be this particular service that pops up. Um, we're continuing our uh, requirements uh, by the order of the uh, post commander in terms of social distancing as you spread out throughout our pews here and wearing of masks, uh, with the exception of when I'm speaking, we still wear them while we're singing. Um, we'll continue to do that until we have another health protection condition update. If you did not receive or have a chance to pick up, there's a welcome table back in the, uh, the narthex, the foyer as you enter, uh, where you can pick up the scripture passage for this morning. Uh, we'll be continuing our message uh, in Philippians chapter 2, uh, particularly Chaplain Prost will be uh, continuing the verses uh, 1 through 11, but with the emphasis on the latter. You can also find a uh, sheet, perhaps, uh, if it's not available, uh, you can also print these out from the newsletter. Uh, which you can obtain through going through our uh, Facebook page and ensuring that uh, we have your email address. And we, get, we send out a newsletter every weekend uh, with the scripture passages as well as the, uh, the songs. Any other announcements that I should be mentioning? All right. Well, with. Say again? This is true. Uh, I think we're a little bit beyond uh, maybe 30 now. So we still have room for more. If you want to RSVP, uh, you simply go through the process on that newsletter or the RSO page, and you can find a way to uh, link to that invitation. So we would welcome to see you here in person. Uh, and uh, until then, uh, we'll continue to worship the Lord, uh, whether you're here or at home. Our call to worship is found in that last book of the Bible in Revelation. Hear these words. Then I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders, the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. We come to worship. Amen. Let us worship God. Praise him, crown him, King of Kings, our ascription of praise. Yeah. 
us pray. Loving God, as we are gathered here to meet you, may the power of your Spirit and the presence of your Savior, as you have promised when we gather together, be with us now. Come to hear our hearts, to hear our voices, as we seek to worship you in spirit and in truth. You, O oh Lord, are the beginning of all and the end of all. We find our life in you, even as you knew us before we were born. In you we become and we live. You sustain us, O oh God, by your gracious and mighty hand. O oh loving God and Father, we are here and yet you are everywhere, around us, within us, and you know our very inmost thoughts. In you we hope, in you we live. Continue in this time together of rest in the Sabbath to be sustained and also to be encouraged and nourished in the very fountain of, the fountain of peace. O oh, Jesus, our Lord, and grace us now with the power of your Spirit that we may be more conformed into the image of your Son. O oh, loving God, we worship and we adore you, and we crown you with many crowns. Amen. Please remain standing as we sing, Crown Him with Many Crowns. seated. In worship, as we have given adoration and praise to 
the living God who sustains us, we also seek to kneel before him and to receive from him that grace that continues to purify us and sanctify us. And so we confess our sins. We don't necessarily do that to an individual. We do that to the Lord Almighty. We do it privately, and occasionally we do it corporately. And so we gather from this chapel and from all who watch and listen to corporally confess our sins. And this happens in generations over generations, and it's happened in the past where others have confessed their sins. I've shared before from the Valley of Vision, and these were the Puritans who had, as history continues to beat them up with many sins, and only highlight those, but they confess their sins very deeply and with great words. And so I offer this as a corporate way for us to confess, and then we'll have an opportunity to silently confess in our own hearts. Hear these words. O oh, Father, enlarge my heart, warm my affections, open my lips, supply words that proclaim love lusters at Calvary. There, grace removes my burdens and heaps them on thy Son, made a transgressor a curse and sin for me. There, the sword of thy justice smote the man thy fellow. There, thy infinite attributes were magnified, and infinite atonement was made. There, infinite punishment was due, and infinite punishment was endured. Christ was all anguish that I might be all joy, cast off that I might be brought in, trodden down as an enemy that I might be welcomed as a friend, surrendered to hell's worst that I might attain heaven's best, stripped that I might be clothed, wounded that I might be healed, a thirst that I might drink, tormented that I might be conformed, made a shame that I might inherit glory, entered darkness that I might have eternal light. My Savior wept that all tears might be wiped from my eyes, groaned that I might have endless song, endured all pain that I might have unfading health, bore a thorny crown that I might have a glorious diadem bowed his head that I might uplift mine, experienced reproach that I might receive welcome, closed his eyes in death that I might gaze on unclouded brightness, expired that I might forever live. O Father, who spared not thine only Son, that thou mightest spare me, all this transfer thy love designed and accomplished, Help me to adore thee by lips and life. Oh, that my every breath might be ecstatic praise, my every step buoyant with delight, as I see my enemies crushed, Satan baffled, defeated, destroyed, sin buried in the ocean of reconciling blood, hell's gates closed, heaven's portal open. Go forth, O conquering God, and show me thy cross, mighty to subdue, comfort and save. And all of God's people say, Amen. And now, O oh Lord, we pause in our own private way as that great cloud of witness has given us words to echo in our hearts of your saving love for us, that we come before you now with our private confession of sin this week in both things that we have done and left undone, both in word and in deed, we pray. O oh Lord, our list could be long and we would have not time to confess, but we give you thanks that we can move right now into the assurance of your grace and pardon to us. Even as the psalmist said, he, that is you, O oh God, does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, 
so far does he remove our transgressions from us. Amen. And now we seek to pray for our community, for others that may not even be able to be here with us, and for the great needs that our nation and our world continue to strive for and deal with. Let us pray. O oh Lord Jesus Christ, our eternal high priest, you offered yourself to the Father on that altar of the cross, and through that outpouring of the Holy Spirit gave your priestly people a share in your redeeming sacrifice. Hear our prayer, O oh Lord, now for this continual sanctification of all Christians who confess you as Lord and Savior. Grant that all who believe may be ever more conformed into the image of your Son, the Good Shepherd. Create in us pure hearts and a clear conscience. Let us be shepherds according to your own heart, single-minded in service to you and to the church, and shining examples of a holy, simple, and yet joyful life. Grant us mercy of devotion and obedience to you, worthy Lamb of God, who died for us even while we were your enemies. Accomplish in us the fullness of of eternal life, where you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. O oh God, we give you thanks for this forgiveness of our sins, for the grace we need to follow Christ, for strength and endurance in our fight against sin, for holiness and sanctification, for the fruit of the Spirit in our lives, and for assurance and perseverance. We also intercede, O Lord, and pray for the cares and burdens and needs of individuals in our congregation and our community. Even as the echoes of time past and repeated this weekend of justice for all, may it never be a dream, but may it be reality, not only at the foot of your cross, but in our daily lives of seeking to live humbly and justly before you. We pray for our government, for our president, for our leaders at every level, for those in need, for the church, for missionaries, for the advancement of the gospels, both here and around the world. And in that steed of bringing the gospel, we pray for those feet of Chaplain Prost, for his mouth, for his words, for his life, as he preaches in these brief short moments together as we've gathered here. Grace him with divine unction by the power of your spirit and the words he speaks, and may we all have open and obedient hearts. And always, O oh Lord, we seek to be revived in our devotion to you and in our prayer life as faithful disciples who were taught to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. In the cross of Christ I glory. Let us stand as we prepare our hearts for the receiving of God's holy word.
You may be seated. Good morning. It's good to worship with you today. I would ask this time that you, I encourage you to turn to your Bibles if you have them. Uh, it's in the uh, handouts at the back for those who are here with us. Uh, we're continuing our sermon series through the book of Philippians, and today we will focus on Philippians 2, 6 through 11. Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 to 11. And uh, I'm going to read through the 12th verse for context. If you remember, as, we, as we've gone through the sermon series a bit, just to give you context before we come to these passages, uh, if you were with us last week, we talked about a supernatural divine unity. There's a great passion and pleading of Paul to the church. It's a passion of Jesus Christ we had, we explained for the church. In chapter 1, uh, the one thing he asks of the church in that first chapter of this letter was one thing. He said, be united, one mind, one spirit, standing side by side. And then at the beginning of chapter 2 last week, we heard a passionate plea if you have any participation and love and comfort from Christ and the Holy Spirit, again, there's a threefold unity in the first chapter, and he goes back to a fourfold unity he wants, explaining at verse 2 that he wants the church to be of the same mind, the same love, a full accord, one mind. And so the message last week was if we're going to have this all for the sake of the gospel and the witness of Christ, which is our mission, this supernatural divine unity that makes the world turn its head. We need a, a divine, a supernatural humility, if, as it were. So we proceed with that. If we're going to have that, we look to Christ, and the subject today is going to be Christ's humiliation in verses six, seven, and eight, his humiliation and his exaltation in verses 9, 10, 11. And we see there a certain two motivations we have here today that should compel our hearts, two different motivations, if you will, towards this humility uh, by looking to Jesus. Chapter 2 Beginning at verse 5 for context, context, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and Every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Heavenly Father, We want to continue in worship now. And what worshipful, exalted passages these are. We need your spirit. I need your spirit to help open the eyes of our heart, to see Jesus Christ, the beauty, the divine beauty of his humility, the awesome exaltation, that we may worship in a joyful fear at 
you and your divine beauty and that we may be changed and blessed. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So last week we talked about this supernatural calling, if you will, that we as a church are called to, to put others and their interests uh, equal to, above, you know, above our own. It's kind of a sense of the great commandment, uh, love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbors as yourself. It's this deep, loving unity we have despite our differences that is, was Christ's passion to, to show Jesus Christ to the world. And we said it's difficult, especially in these times when the scripture seems to be really true that we have a divisive culture, perhaps like uh, unparalleled in, in most other times. In this social media selfie culture, it seems like the scripture is true that says, the love of many will grow cold, Paul said at the end of his life. Uh, and many will be lovers of self in this self-expression culture. And in the self media culture, we have such a high divine, cult, divine calling, and we're infected by this culture. It's also a culture that when we mess up as Christians, it tends to be broadcast all over the place, doesn't it? When Christian leaders fall, when you say something you regret, uh, media, so many things are blasted to the shame of the cause of Christ in the church. When our leaders and ourselves, that, that it's broadcast out there which so we we need help we heard in the verse we just read the introduce looking to Christ that if we have come to Jesus Christ if you have come to Jesus with a saving faith you have the Holy Spirit you have the mind of Christ the mindset or attitude that he has at least you, you have some of the Holy Spirit already that's your only foundation you can build on to make any progress in this deep, supernatural, loving humility. But we see in verse 5 of our text, it's not just that we already have this, so we just sit back passively and wait for the Holy Spirit to work it. It's, it's, there's a command there. There's a pleading. Paul wouldn't plead like he does if it weren't something that we have to strive after, right? There's, that's why it says after, it says, have this unity and this humility, but to get it, we have to, this mustard seed of the mindset of Christ, the Holy Spirit, we must fan that into pl to flame. We must fertilize that seed and that mindset and take care of that and see it grow like that mustard seed Jesus talks about in the Gospels that turns into the largest of all bu bushes that st starts as a small seed that all the birds of the air can nest there. There has to be a witness of Jesus Christ that is what the Holy Spirit in Christ and Paul is after here. And if that's to happen, the way we accomplish this is by fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our own faith. Right? That makes sense. It's a, there's got to be an effort there. We have to be motivated if you and your marriages are going to have this supernatural humility that puts others before yourself, a love that will show people you're Christians, you need to have a compelling motive because we're going to have the temptations of the flesh and the desires of the flesh with us till the day we die. We're going to be concerned about our own family, our own interests, our own jobs, our own callings. Our, we need to break our own luxuries, our own entertainments. We have to have something to compel us with a motive, and we get that compelling motive to actually take up our cross daily, which Jesus demands, by looking to Jesus, fixing our eyes. And that's exactly what we have here today, is a summary of of the two states of Jesus Christ, his humiliation and exaltation. So let's jump to look at that, and we're going to see how we need a bigger vision of how glorious and how beautiful is his lowering down in a loving humility and be drawn by the beauty of that in our hearts 
to compete with that motive when you've had a long day and you're tired and weary and someone asks you to go that extra mile, that you go with them two miles rather than turn around the other way. We need day by day this other compelling magnetism motive of a beauty, of a humility, of Jesus and how low he went and fall in love with it to expel our motives for so many other things. To actually, when someone, even our Christian brothers and sisters, sometimes metaphorically slap, slap us in the face, sometimes our own loved ones, our children, our spouses, our friends, when they slap us in the face, to not come to a point when we say, enough is enough that we actually turn the other cheek. There's got to be something that will drive our hearts towards that. That's the motive I think we see here as we go, as we look and begin with the glory of Jesus' humility and fall in love with that. And the first thing we need to recognize that we see here in verse 6 is to accurately appreciate how deeply in love Jesus descended down as we look at that uh, uh, three steps of descent we're going to look at today, we first need to stop and pause a bit more of how infinitely high a place that he came down from. Verse 6, Jesus, though he was in the form of God did not count equality with God, a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself. We see in the text there, there's a participle that said there in this text that when he emptied himself, whatever that means, this emptying, this giving out, when he did that, he was being God. I like how the NIV puts it. Being in very nature God. That's what the Greek term means here. It's not just some outward form, but it's an essential characteristic. We see here in verse 6 that Jesus was fully God. And I, an ex idea of when he emptied, he was God. And he was preexistent. That's what we see in all scriptures, right? When he said, when he was on this earth, before Abraham was, I am. Or when John and Paul say that Christ is the creator of heaven and earth. When Jude, as happens so many times in the New Testament, ties Jesus to the Yahweh, Jehovah of the Old Testament. When Jude says, it was Jesus who delivered the people Israel from bondage in Egypt. Yahweh is Jehovah of the Old Testament is that second person of the Trinity, the Jesus Christ whom we know. But stop and consider where he started from before we look at his descent. Because you can't judge his humility solely by how deep he went. We need to realize how infinite he freely decided to make that descent of humility and love. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit before any angels or creation existed were in an infinite, indescribable love relationship, infinite power, infinite joy. And yet somehow they were so full and so giving in their love, they decided to further create and give. That's what God's he as God is all about. This fullness of this fountain, uh, we see that a bit in the word grass there. It said he did not consider being very God, equal with God the Father, fully God. He didn't consider something that he needed to cling to. That word in the Greek suggests a, a grasping, a, I, I got to cling to it. He gives. And, and some critics will sometimes look at Christianity and say, well, why, if God's all happy, I guess, did he need us? Or is he kind of needy? Why did he give? Why did he create people? To, did he need something? No. I love how the theologian Jonathan Edwards put, puts it. Surely it is no argument of neediness in God that he is inclined to communicate 
of his infinite fullness. It's no argument of the emptiness or deficiency of a fountain that it is inclined to overflow. Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, infinite joy, said, let's, was willing to humbly descend and we see emptied himself and become fully human. Fully human. Now, the, the, the biblical theologians, there's a lot of debate on what that emptied himself is. Some said, well, maybe he had to empty himself and left being God. But Orthodox Christianity, basic Christianity as it's been developed by Catholics, Protestants, and Orthodox, say he remained fully God. But he emptied himself of the perks and privileges and joys of being God by fully taking on human morphe and form, pouring himself out into that lowly container. It says man was created lower than the angels. He poured himself out into that. And we see that here from those infinite heights in the ivory palaces of full power and glory, full power and joy to no full humanity, subject to weakness, subject to leaving aside, fully experiencing from the inside as a human, not experiencing the perk of knowing all things as God. Uh, leave, pouring out and in his humanity, experiencing suffering, pain. It says in Hebrews that he, at Hebrews 2.17, he had to be ma made like us in every respect as we were, but without sin, subject to temptation in his experiencing, fully experiencing that, fully human, hunger, thirst, weariness, in order to be a sacrifice and full representative of humanity to save us. So that right there, we just need to understand the majestic height and love which he was able to leave just to become a human. But then another second overlapping le level of descent is we see in verse 7, becoming not just a human, knowing he was God, knowing what he left in experience of as a baby, um, but taking on the form of a servant, of a slave. The one who knew the highest heights became the greatest servant or slave, same word doulos in the Greek used there, a level of Slavery and service to all mankind that no other human has ever experienced. He was born, he remained the emperor of the world and creator, king of all kings. We see glimpses of, the, we see glimpses of his remaining deity throughout the Gospels. When the wise men come and give him gifts as a baby in that makeshift bed and animal's trough, uh, that gifts of a king. We see it when he could say, peace be still to the wind and the waves. But overall, he says, he, the Son of Man came not to be served, even though he was the king of the universe, but to serve and give his life as a ransom to all, to serve all mankind and offer himself as a sacrifice, as that lamb we heard at our opening worship today. Verse 7, he took the form of a servant and he humbled himself by becoming obedient. He had, it says he was born under the law. Even though he is the great lawgiver, Yahweh of the Old Testament, the great judge, the great ruler, he fully subordinated himself and is the only human to ever lowly subordinate himself, taking seriously what God had commanded, being found as a human, he submitted himself in worship to the Father God. He submitted himself to all the laws and became a servant of all 
in perfect love and living that life of obedience to the law. But that's not it. We know that service, he infinitely descended in love and willingly to be a human, to be a slave of all, with no rights, no right to object like Paul did when he was mistreated. He said, wait, I'm a citizen of Rome. When Jesus, when they cast aspersions, he remained silent. What that meant was also a life of suffering, infinite joy as God to experiencing a deep suffering, deeper and more amazing and fearfully worshipful than any human being has ever experienced. In his physical death for us, just look at the physical suffering he experienced throughout his life. Um, there's the normal sufferings we all have as humans. He spent the first years, 30 years of his life, right, just submitting to his parents at his occupation, um, humbly submitting to the law, knows all the human sufferings of this life. But we see a rising suffering in his ministry, the mistreatment, the allegations that he's a blasphemer, that he has a demon. He's born, he was born in sin. His mother had him out of wedlock. The shame he had to put up with. But of course, what's emphasized in this text is that great apex of his passion in that last week, leading to Gethsemane and leading to the cross, where the physical tortures, which are many we know of crucifixion, our only pointers, are the theologians tell us, of a spiritual suffering that no human to this point, living or dead, has ever had to experience because it was the almighty wrath of God himself placed on him from the world that as he got closer to that point of that suffering death at the cross, made him say, my soul is sorrowful to the point of death. We see hints of it in expressing a loneliness when his apostles couldn't stay awake to pray with him even, as he's sweating drops of blood in this anguish. And as they all desert him, have you ever had a best friend betray you and desert you when you were in a low time? They all deserted him, except for Peter, who followed him. And then he knew, not only denied he even knew Jesus, but called down curses on himself. Jesus! And he, he called down curses if he even had anything to do or knew with him. And Jesus looked at him and knew that pain. These are just pointers to the real apex was the man who knew an intimacy of God that we will never approach. Not only had that ripped away because of our sin, but had to experience, again, that wrath of God placed upon him that made him cry out in the de dereliction, they call it, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? No one has yet ever experienced that wrath, that spiritual suffering that he, as God, could have called legions of angels at any time as God, but resisted that temptation as people mocked him and said, Savior, <laughs> look at him. He can't even save himself. Save yourself. Continued to descend down deeper into that low point of suffering for you, for me, for the world as a lamb and an offering to his father. It's only hinted at in the scriptures where it talks about these deep periods of darkness. There's almost silence in the gospels that we're meant to fall down on our faces and worship at. This amazing humility. We're supposed to fall in love with so great a humility. We need to appreciate this more daily, this deep humility Jesus experienced. And we should say, that is so beautiful. 
that kind of love and descent is so amazing, I want to experience it more. As Paul expresses here in this book of Philippians, what a privilege that we get to know him more in a fellowship of these sufferings, that we're actually called, as much as that was done for us, that's the main point of the suffering of God, that's what it took to save us from our sin and bring us into God's family. He wants us to call us into a greater fellowship of that suffering. He wants us to imitate that, is what he says here. And we're able to because we have Christ in us. But we should want to experience that fellowship deeper. If we truly love that, and we see with the hearts that have been, our eyes are opened by the Holy Spirit, the beauty, the glorious, awesome beauty of that humility, we should say, I want to know that more. That's what Paul is saying in Philippians, right? That's what will move you, that magnetism, when you're feeling tired and cranky and you really want to look at work on your finances or be comfortable after a long day versus looking out for others and their interests and looking out for them in love. We should we realize we have to get lower to really experience that fellowship of Christ. Paul says that in Philippians chapter 1. When he says to me, yeah, I'm in prison. <laughs> you understand, my joy is full. Because to me, to live is Christ. It's what he says in, chapter, in the next chapter when we'll hear him say that everything else compared to knowing Jesus is rubbish. I count them as rubbish, he'll say in chapter 3. That I may know him, this one who was willing to go so low in the power of his resurrection and I may share his sufferings. In other words, what a privilege, becoming like him in his death. Not that I have already obtained it or have already made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that. The way to press on to more Christ-likeness is to say with a great passion, how do I get lower? How do I put every, how do I, just in a small echo of Jesus, get lower and humble myself and be, and be, what an honor that, like the people in the Bible, I can leap for joy. I can praise God when I'm counted worthy to suffer for him and get to know that fellowship more. Do you sense that magnetism that Paul's trying to get out here? When he, and he says, I haven't taken hold of that, but I forget everything lying behind and strain forward to what lies ahead. So how do we get that more? Well, a sermon, coming to church, hearing the word preached is one way. We need theology. We need to meditate on Scripture. As I said earlier, the whole Old Testament about Yahweh, that's Jesus. It is that awesome God who is fearful, who speaks and mountains melt, whose wrath is as great as the fear that is due him. That is simultaneously so gentle, so loving, so giving that he was willing to sink to incredible, unimaginable depths that we can't imagine in this life. We'll be praising it forever. Worthy is the lamb that was slain. He's the lion of the Old Testament. We need to meditate on theology. That's true in Jesus. But another practical way I would suggest that we can be more driven and understand this humility of Jesus and portray it is by living it out, imitating not only Jesus, but we need, we're humans. We need concrete examples. You need me. I need you. We need, you need each other in your marriages. I need my wife to show me Christ so I can imitate the Christ that she has in her as she works humility. She needs me to just demonstrate that. We, that's that unity and communion in the church as we imitate Christ, and yes, imitate one another. That's a huge biblical theme. That's why Paul is urging this in practice and the hard work of Christianity to the church. He says, as he says in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. In this book in Philippians, in chapter 3, he's going to say, brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk 
according to the example you have in us. Or in chapter 4, what you've learned and received and heard and seen in me. And a lot of that is loving humility, right? That's the one thing he's emphasizing in this book. Practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. That's how we get more of the experience of Jesus. So, so far, the great Puritan Thomas Brooks put it this way, the secret key to heaven. Oh, that we were as much in love with the examples of good men as others in this world are in love with the examples of bad men. Should not we love to look upon the pious examples of those that are the lively and lovely picture of Christ? The pious examples of others should be the mirrors by which we dress ourselves. He is the best and wisest Christian that imitates those Christians that are most eminent in grace. It is noble to live by the examples of the most eminent saints. Okay, so far, that's, we have, we saw in these scriptures, in that humiliation, a compelling motive for us to practice this with one another to get to know that fellowship greater. But the concluding motive we see is not just a compelling glory of this humility, but we see it in the exaltation of Christ. It's a motivation of the glorious reward of an exaltation that Jesus in his humanity achieved that has to be achieved through humility. There's a relationship throughout Scripture as it says, it praises God in the Psalms. For though the Lord is high, he has regard for the lowly. But the haughty he knows from afar. It's the wisdom of Proverbs. One's pride will bring him low, but he who is lowly in spirit will obtain honor. It's the general truth Jesus said that in Matthew 23, whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Jesus, in his humanity, that infinite height that he was willing to go down and get low in humility and love in an infinite depth, is the reason the Bible gives for the great exaltation that he brought, even in his human nature. Humanity created lower than the angels is brought out of death in the exaltation in those verses. Ascended, and not just ascended to heaven where the angels reside and God resides, but it says seated. His ascension included he sat down as a human, as our adoptive brother, at the very seat of, by God Almighty. He judges the universe, and someday soon, that will be evident to all. As our scripture says today, when every, many, most people, the Bible says that few are saved, but many, all, will bow down, all will declare Jesus Christ as Lord, the God of the Old Testament, the judge, to the glory of God the Father. Jesus Christ, this human, will be the judge of angels and men. And the wonderful thing about these promises is that we share, we are seated with him already to some extent. We will experience some of that ourselves. And there's not time to get into it today, but the theologians, a lot of Christian teachers are afraid to talk about it, but the Bible talks about that great, compelling motive of the reward of exaltation that we should be driven by. That, it's, that we have different degrees of reward we're going to get as Christians. We're all going to be equally children of God. We're all equally forgiven of all our sins. But the Bible makes clear over and over that we will all appear before the judgment seat of Christ as Christians to receive the things done in the body. That some will be barely saved, but only as through fire their works will be built up. Others will receive great reward. It makes clear that we're to be building treasure in heaven. Jesus was aware of this. It says how in his humanity, when he's sweating drops of blood, did he endure that cross? It says it was for the joy set before him. He prayed, 
the night before he died, Father, restore to me the glory I had before I came into the world. He felt the weight of that glory, that reward that waited for him. We need to realize that motive too and see the pattern that he sent that to the extent you're willing to get low despite the suffering and pain and love and get to know Christ in that fellowship, you will be exalted. God will be faithful. He'll give back a million times whatever you give, that there is no real sacrifice you can make because of this dynamic. I love how C.S. Lewis put it, in the weight of glory. We need to feel this magnetic weight of glory and reward to override all their other desires. C.S. Lewis said in the Weight of Glory essay, if we consider the unblushing promises of reward and the staggering nature of the rewards promised in the Gospels, it would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong but too weak. We're half-hearted creatures fooling around with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered to us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he can't imagine what is meant by the offer of the holiday at the sea, we are far too easily pleased. Ultimately, there is a wisdom that I pray the Holy Spirit would work there is a reason why God in his infinite wisdom and a plan before the foundation of the world was willing to plan to suffer at such a deep level. Was it worth it? Yes, because he was purchasing the reward of a bride, a body of Christ, a further magnification and diversification of the glories of Christ in the body of Christ, in a bride, in you and me. Holy Spirit, may you forever help draw us, compel us by the humility of Christ, by the reward of exaltation in Jesus' pattern that comes by taking that path of low humility of love. May we trust you as for that. May we worship you more for that and follow our Lord and Savior, the God-man, Jesus Christ, as we look forward to praising him as the lying lamb forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Please join me in our closing hymn, And Can It Be? We'll sing the first, second, and final stanza. And can it be that I should gain an interest in the Savior's blood? Let us sing together.
Friends, in worship, in song, singing, and in prayer, we have been caught up into the heavens at the right hand of God the Father, whom we can boldly approach. Now receive this blessing, this benediction. O King of nations, your reign spreads through all the lands. Fashion us into an obedient people, that we may spread the good news of your reign of perfect peace and justice, until all creation will finally rejoice in your perfect will, until all will bend the knee to the King of kings and Lord of lords, in whose name we pray, even Jesus Christ, your Son and our Savior. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep our hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of God's Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace to serve the Lord. Thank you.